Well, doesn't that smell good? See, we're, we're talking about the fruit of the Spirit. And the last one is on self-control. And it's the last one. And we're going to be covering that today while we're smelling those meatballs. Woo-wee! They smell good. I'm excited. And then next week's a carry-in dinner. Sounds good to me. All right, Galatians chapter 5, 22 and 23. As we wind up the fruit of the Spirit with, with, nine, with uh, 7, 8, and 9. The last of the fruits that Paul lists in Galatians. And then uh, Pastor Reimer will be here next week. While Carl and I make a trip over uh, to the, the um, Creation Museum. And then... Uh, then that next week, we're off celebrating Thanksgiving. I'll bring a message that kind of ties that all in with Thanksgiving, the fruit of the Spirit, and all this, this last series in with Thanksgiving. Wow. Anybody got your Christmas decorations up yet? <laughs> we just had some breaking good weather here if you're, if you're getting anxious. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, agape. Joy, kara, peace, shalom, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness. And self-control. And against such things there is no law. Faithfulness. The seventh of the fruit. Faithful. Anybody come to mind? Somebody in your life you think of that's faithful. Faithfulness. Loyal, trustworthy, dependable, faithful. They can be counted on even when times are tough. Especially when times are tough, you want that person on the team. Faithful, trustworthy. Won't give up. Isn't double-minded. Some of those things can capture faithful for you. You got somebody in mind? Faithful. Somebody you look up to. That's a faithful person. Faithfulness. Sometimes you ever feel like faithfulness is in short supply? It's just not something that people have an abundance of and there's not a not, it's not an abundance of faithfulness. Sometimes you feel that way. King Solomon did. In Proverbs chapter 20, verse 6, King Solomon declared, Well, many, a lot of people, many a man proclaims his own steadfast love. I declare my steadfast love. But a truly faithful man <laughs> is hard to find. Oh, we'll proclaim it. We'll claim it. But to actually come through on it is what Solomon's talking about. Now the one true God of the Bible has always been known as a God of faithfulness. That is the God, our God, the God of the Bible. Inspiring faithfulness by His own faithfulness. He inspires ours. Generation after generation. Anybody think of their grandparents as faithful? Their parents as faithful? The line. That we're now a part of the legacy down the line of faithfulness. Deuteronomy 7 9 says, Know therefore that the Lord your God, the faithful God, who keeps covenants and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. 
And as the Holy Spirit grows in us, the Holy Spirit, it doesn't have to actually grow in us. The Holy Spirit is complete in us. But we have to grow in letting the Holy Spirit have more of us. So I, I'll use that term as the Holy Spirit gains more access to us. He's able to blend our lives closer with His. There's not so much difference between His character and our character. And He begins to blend us that we look more like Him. And we're able to reflect Him into the world much more powerfully, much more actively, much more accurately. Paul writes about this faithful God, and that's why we can be faithful. Because we have a faithful God. That's His character. And Paul's saying, Him in us, through the Holy Spirit, creates faithfulness in our character. He writes in 1 Corinthians 1.9, God is faithful, by whom you were called into fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, any of us ever gotten to the point where we feel like there's nothing left to hold on to? We've been sliding down that rope and we're at the end of the rope. And there's nothing left to hold on to. Anybody been here? Anybody been there? Yeah? We feel like there's nothing left. Somebody please tie a knot at the the end of that rope. Something to grab on to. But God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, and all the angels never quit holding on to us. Sometimes we feel like we've lost our grip. We don't have a a shred to hold on to left. And when we feel that way more than any other time, we're probably ready to remember like no other time. It's He who holds us. He's the faithful God. That's faithfulness. We may even look back later after we've gone through times like that and we look back upon those times as the most precious times in our life that we would never trade for anything. Amen? Some of you have been through that. You look back on the fingerprints of God all over that time and you say, I would never trade that. What He did to shape me Anchor me? I'll never trade that. He builds faithfulness in us through the toughest times many times, doesn't He? Even in our suffering. We trust God and we choose to be faithful to Him who is faithful to us. That's faithfulness. And as Paul teaches us in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17 and 18, would you turn to me for this with me for this one, please? 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 17 and 18. This is one I slipped in after I had already prepared the message. This one slipped in yesterday, so it's not up there. Chapter 4, 2 Corinthians, verse 17. For this light momentary affliction. Oh, it doesn't feel light, does it? It doesn't feel momentary. This affliction, that word affliction isn't just like hangnail. Affliction. This light affliction. This momentary affliction. Paul goes on to say is preparing us An eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. Beyond all comparison. There's, there's, we can't even wrap our heads around this. Beyond all comparison. There's nothing we have to compare it to. What we have to look forward to. We can't compare it to anything we have. 
And everything we carry that is a weight and is a burden is momentary, is light compared to all that's yet to come. Verse 18, and as we look not to the things that are seen. That's a trick, isn't it? As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. That's a trick. That's, that's a challenge. That's the opportunity. For the things that are seen, everything that we could lay our eyes on is transient, he says, temporary. But the things that are unseen, behind all the seen things, at work, behind all those things, he calls those eternal. In 2 Timothy 2.13, Paul says, if we are faithless. Anybody here stand to put themselves in that number? Faithless? Faithless. If we are faithless, He remains faithful. If we get to the end of the rope, we let go. He does not let go. Though we are faithless, He remains faithful. For He cannot deny Himself. He can't deny who He is. He's faithful. That's who He is. He cannot deny Himself. Isn't that an incredible passage? God's faithfulness doesn't depend on our faithfulness. God's faithfulness doesn't depend on any circumstance. He's faithful no matter what. And our faithfulness shouldn't depend on the circumstances either. Will I choose to be faithful as long as everything's going well? Hey, but if, if circumstances change and things go in a bad direction, you can count me out. Is that me? Is that the man I want to be? Is that the person you want to be? Oh, as long as things are, are okay. But, if not, all bets are off. See, the best version of myself, the one I aspire to, is faithful. No matter the circumstance. I can be faithful because I have a faithful God. And His Spirit is growing and living in me. And He is faithful. Now pause for a moment and ask yourself, if, just imagine, if everybody is as faithful as you, so as faithful as you are, now we're all as faithful as you are. Let's just imagine this. If everybody is as faithful as you, what kind of church would this be? How would that change this, this congregation? Would there be plenty of teachers for all the classes and Awana activities? Would the church be growing spiritually at every turn and every corner, anchored in the Word? If everyone was as faithful as me, as you, as you. Would the church be sharing Christ all over the community? If everyone was as faithful as you, would anybody be sharing Christ? Would anyone be connecting with others, especially newcomers, and, and inviting them over to their house or, or connecting and, and, and making sure to, that those connections are made with visitors and newcomers? Would anybody be doing that? If everyone were as faithful as you, would the church be short of funds or overflowing with ministry opportunities funded would the church even exist if everyone was as faithful as you? Wow. 
And if everyone were as faithful as you, would it be said that Christians are the best employees? I can't get enough Christians at work. Would that be said of Christians if everybody was faithful as you? Or would it be said that Christians are the best employers? I love working for Christians. They're the best. Or would it be said that you can trust a Christian with the keys? They're faithful. They're trustworthy. Especially when times get hard. And even when no one's looking, you can trust them. If everyone was as faithful as you, what would the world look like? Huh. Do we owe it to ourselves to let the Holy Spirit stir faithfulness in our lives? Absolutely. In your message notes, you have William Barclay's quote. He was a Bible scholar and he finished writing on faithfulness. He said, faithfulness is indeed a great word. It describes the person on whose faithful service we may rely. On whose loyalty we may depend. Whose word we can unswervedly accept. And it describes the person in whom there is the unswerving and inflexible love of Jesus Christ and the utter dependability of God. The utter dependability of God. Let's just wrap up faithfulness with Proverbs 28, 20, and it tells us a faithful man will abound in blessings. Now gentleness. The eighth fruit is gentleness. Now like love, agape, and joy, kara, and peace, shalom, the word for gentleness Prautes in the Greek has no English word that captures it. So where the English words capture it, I have been skipping the Greek and Hebrew and stuff, but this is one of those where you really have to return to the root. See, because this word prautes is used to describe a very strong animal. Imagine a big, mighty, strong horse, for example. Or an elephant, even bigger, mightier animal. Praotes is used by the Greeks to describe these animals when they are tame and under authority, when they are under the control, when they have been tamed. So, some of you that love horses, Praotes would relate. This is a mighty beast, right? Could knock us down in an instant if they decide to. Or it can be the most loyal, hard-working friend you could ever have, right? A horse, prautes. So it's power, great power under control, under authority. So when you think of gentle, like this word here, the Bible, the fruit of the Spirit is gentleness. Do you think of a mighty beast? That's probably not what comes to mind, is it? Do you think of a a strong horse or a big elephant? No. You think of a sort of a mild-mannered person and they're so gentle, right? No. That's why we need to go back to the root here. It's a mighty strong beast that can take you down but is under authority. And this is the word that Paul's using here. Now this is a passage I'd like you to turn to as well if, you, if you'd be able. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. 
I use this passage as the Bible study for um, this week at, at Wheat State. And uh, this is something you could expand on, actually put a whole series of sermons together for this passage. Ephesians chapter 4, 1 through 2. I therefore, I therefore, Paul says, a prisoner for the Lord. A prisoner. A prisoner is not going to have freedom to choose what they want to do, when they want to do it, how they want to do it. They don't eat what they want to eat. They eat what they get given. They don't have freedom to do what they want to do. They have freedom to do what they're given freedom to do. He says, I'm not under my authority. I'm under his authority as his position here. I, as a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling of which you have been called. Paul's saying, I'm a prisoner, and you as a prisoner of the Lord, I urge you to walk worthy. And what is this worthy he's talking about? It's mind-blowing. Walk worthy of the calling which you have been called, verse 2, with all humility. He says the walk that is worthy of our calling is humble first. Kind of like Jesus saying, The first beatitude is blessed are those who are poor in spirit. The humble. That is the beginning. Why is this the beginning of a life worthy of Jesus Christ? It all starts with humility. Because we're no longer first. He is. We're no longer in charge. He is. So Paul starts with humility. And then he adds praoutes. Gentleness. And that's not like, oh, nice kitty. It's, nice kitty. Right? That's praoutes. After humility, he says, strength under authority. Mighty strength tamed with patience, bearing with one another in agape, love. So, let's go back to this horse. There's a picture up here of two horses. Yes. Okay, now you can't tell completely from this. But here's a horse. The first one is not in a good mood. Does this first horse trust that trainer? Not yet, right? That that horse is not in a submissive relationship with, with that man, is he? No. Now, this horse, you can't tell, but... This gal's riding her without a bridle. And in 2006, won the freestyle championship, riding a horse in bare feet, without a bridle, without a saddle. Stacy Westfall. She happens to be deaf. She's a horse whisperer. And she could just put pressure with her knees tug on the mane, lean a certain direction, and that mighty beast would follow. And this picture's taken when that horse is running at full speed across the arena, and right at the time Stacy nudges, puts on the brake, and literally slides, skidding towards the wall and stops right at the wall. At a full gallop, Stacy could have just let it go right into the wall. But at the right time, pulled on, and that horse stopped skidding that far from the wall. Now, does this horse trust its master? Is this horse, the second one, under submission and under authority? But it's a mighty beast, right? Strong, and at any time could turn against Stacy but is humble first. Praoutes second. Wow. And patience.
patient serve. Now, the horse kicking and fighting against the trainer doesn't trust the trainer, but the championship horse trusts the trainer, the one that wins the ribbon. Now, the first horse doesn't have pro taste, doesn't just fighting. There's no relation, good, healthy relationship between the, the trainer and the horse. But in the second one, there's a great relationship. Could you say maybe even love between the horse and the trainer? Maybe even joy when they see each other? Maybe a peace? Oh, the trainer's here. Oh, a peace? Patience, kindness, all the fruit? starts to flow in this relationship, through this relationship. And God's inviting you and me to allow Him to have the reins in this relationship, to allow Him to lead so He can make a champion worthy of honor, worthy of respect, a standard worthy for others to emulate and live by. Wow. There's only two people in the Bible that this word is used for. One is Jesus. Who's the other one? Moses. Only two people in the Bible that this word's used for. Now, do Jesus and Moses come to mind as great power? Somebody with great power? Yeah. And do Jesus and Moses come to mind as people with great power, great position, great authority under God's control? Absolutely. That's the picture here. And all the great saints of Christianity through all the ages surrendered to the Master's control. That's what made them great. They surrendered. Protes. To the master's control. And in Luke 9, 23 and 24, Jesus says, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself daily and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life, for my sake, will save it. This is one of my life verses, Galatians 2.20. If, if it's easy for you to switch from Ephesians to Galatians, go to Galatians chapter 2.20. Maybe you'd like to mark this as well. 1 Timothy 1.15, Paul says, I am the greatest sinner of all. This is a, a, a saying trustworthy and worthy of all acceptance he says that i am the greatest sinner of all and paul who said i am the greatest sinner of all is saying these words in galatians 2 20 he says i have been crucified with christ Whew. wow it is no longer i who live but christ who lives in me and the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith, not by sight, by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. I have been crucified with Christ. In 1 Corinthians 15, 31, Paul writes, I die every day. Good morning, dear. How's your day? Good. I'm dead. I'm dead to who? Myself. I'm alive to who? To Christ. Do you and I have great power for good or for harm? Do we? Do you have great power for good and for harm? Aren't you a mighty beast? Even the tongue is a fiery flame, right? A mighty beast. Is it under control? Is it gentle? Under authority? Prautes. Now, tremendous power. 
under God's control. And that leads us directly into self-control, doesn't it? Interesting how these all flow. Just like the Beatitudes, they all have a sequence of building on each other. But self-control, the ninth and last fruit in Paul's list to the Galatians, is the key to lasting success with any of the other eight. What's it like if, if you go out and harvest in the garden and you put everything in your bag or your basket and you just keep putting it in and there's a hole in the basket and it keeps falling out the other end? Who cares? You, you, oh my gosh, you just wasted your time. Self-control is like the, the basket without a hole. Lack of self-control is the basket with the hole. Now imagine a a city back in the old days where there were walls around the city. And if this was a big, prosperous, successful city, they had big, tall walls and thick walls, right? And strong gates. Why? Because somebody else was going to come and try to get something for for nothing. And, and, And take, if that city had no walls, if they had a big, prosperous city, it was just a matter of time. Somebody's going to come. T- somebody bigger, badder, t- tougher was going to come and take away whatever they wanted. Easy pickings. A city without a wall back in the day. Oh, that was a dangerous city to live in, especially if you're going to be prosperous. Now imagine that city. Proverbs twenty five twenty eight says, A man without self-control is like a city broken into and left without walls. It's like a city without walls. A man without self-control is like a city with big holes in the walls if they have them. Or walls but no gates. Anything can go in and out. How everybody's doing it. Self-control is the city wall. Imagine a big fire in the fireplace, but one little spark comes out and hits something flammable on the floor. And the whole house can go down. One little spark outside the fireplace. Self-control is the fireplace. Imagine a big ship without a rudder. Maybe a sailing ship with big sails and that wind is blowing, but without a rudder, the captain has no control. And that ship is crashing into the rocks, gashing holes in the side of the ship, and sinking, going under. Self-control is the rudder. We all know that we have desires that need to be controlled. Uh, Meatballs, just saying. Right? By the way, how many per person... Just wondering, ladies. We all have things. We all have desires that we need to bring under control. And the funny thing is, we're so optimistic about our own ability to control all those things, but we're super pessimistic about everybody else's ability to control all those things. Isn't it weird how we think Everybody else messes up all the time, but we got it kind of together, right? See, we got it under control, yet the level of love, agape, the level of joy, no matter the circumstances, love, no matter, peace, no matter, the level of these fruit in our lives tells us a different story, doesn't it? Yeah? Yeah? We don't have it all under control. It's proof that the Holy Spirit has a lot of room to grow in our lives. And when Jesus talks about taking care of the log in my own eye, I would much rather focus on the speck in everybody else's. How about you? Yeah. He knows that we're over, overly critical about others. Speck, 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 ooh, speck, speck. How many of you painted an entire room and somebody comes in, you say, how do you look? And they go, ooh, 
there's a little speck right there. Isn't that an opportunity to grow the Holy Spirit right there in your spirit? Uh huh. Yeah. First Peter five eight. Peter warns us to be sober minded, to be watchful, because your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Wow. Lack of self control opens the gate. It leads us into every single sin we ever commit. And if we look at sin as anything that turns us away from God, from focusing on God, being under His submission, sin is anything that causes us to miss the mark of of aiming for God. Every single sin we commit comes from lack of of self-control. And as a holy work of the Holy Spirit, the self part of self-control is just making sure that the self is getting out of control. Out of the control business and putting God in control. So we talk about self-control. It's really, as a fruit of the Spirit, it's really about myself getting myself out of the control and putting Him in control. (laughs) We talk about self-control, but it's really not me controlling myself. It's me only making one change. To stop controlling myself and allow Him to do it. So that my life is under submission to Him. He's the trainer. I'm prautes. Jesus modeled this surrender for us perfectly, didn't He? He couldn't ask for a perfect model. We got it. The more we surrender, the more the Spirit can and will lead us. But it's up to us. It takes the self to surrender control to show true godly agape. Instead of manipulating people or doing for them if they do for you, trying to get something from people, being the best friends with people who can do the most for you, not caring about people who can't do anything for you, that's not agape. It takes surrender of control to agape. It takes the self to surrender control to have godly joy when we're facing difficult situations. We're sliding down the rope. we got rope burn. There's nothing stopping us from sliding right off the rope. It takes surrender of control to have joy sliding off the rope. How is that possible? It's not less God and less God. It takes the self to surrender control to get along with others to make peace instead of constantly getting into conflict, constantly having, you know, uh, picking on each other, constantly being choosing something to be uh, disappointed with. It takes surrender control. It takes surrender of control to not automatically look out only for myself, but to look out for others as well. In fact, put them first. It takes the self to surrender control to do good. To go through the narrow gate that leads to life. The wide gate leads to destruction. It takes the self to surrender control to be faithful. And to not have our faith shattered because somebody made fun of us. We got unfriended. Somebody said a bad thing. We got fired. Somebody withdrew their contract because somebody's passing rumors or gossip that isn't true. We remain good. And it takes self to surrender control to be faithful. And it takes the self to surrender control to be prautes, gentle. Showing compassion and mercy and real love. The way God shows us, no matter who, when, where, why, or how, whether we're besties or not. And with this in mind, we can start to appreciate the strength and clarity Jesus is speaking with when He says in Luke 9.23 that we should deny ourselves and take up our cross daily. 
and follow Him. Self-control is taking up our cross and following daily. Every time we truly, truly accept that God is for us, that He has a plan that we are part of, He has a plan, and He's working it together for good, Every time we choose that, and we know it flows first through the hands of love before it gets to us, even this situation, even this situation, and every time we recognize that, then surrender becomes more natural. As our faith increases, our trust increases. Trust in the God who made you and knows and loves you better than you know yourself. And knows your future better than you know yourself. Would you pray with me? Father.